What's up, yeah? So this morning, I uh, I don't know exactly what triggered it, but I started looking up uh, key Keynesian. Is that how you say it? Keynesian economics. I started uh, looking up uh, like modern monetary theory. I started looking up all these different schools of thought economically. I'm getting kind of quiet because, well, it's actually the middle of the day. I just, I don't know. So I won't be loud. <laughs> but um, I started looking a lot of stuff up. And uh, one of the main ideas that kind of drew my attention was, uh, what do they call it? Was it like price push inflation or something like that? And that's, and, and that's kind of what I say is like the main factor in uh, inflation and prices going up. I don't think it's directly, um, you know, just an increase in money supply. I think that's wrong. I think there's, there's a number of factors that need to be involved, which includes there being an increase in money supply. But I think uh, like a, along a supply chain, uh, for one, you know, there could also be other pressures, you know, like uh, in operating a business that cause businesses to have to increase prices um, to keep the business running, keep it profitable. Otherwise, they'll just cease to exist. You know, they'll, they won't be profitable. And before you know, they'll go bankrupt and, you know, they'll just be out of business. And, uh, you know, that can be a government mandated wage hikes you know like like a mandatory minimum wage or something like that that you know causes businesses to have to pay a certain amount which is like a you know, like a mandated fixed cost for those businesses um or it could be along a supply chain you know let's say a company's producing a product um and one of these companies you know, either decides themselves to raise prices or are forced to raise prices themselves because of another further along the uh, supply chain uh, price hike. Um, you know, everybody along that line will have to raise prices just to, um, you know, still be profitable. I mean, that if you just consider how businesses run and, uh, you know, understand that they have to be profitable to keep running um you know unless you know they get money from somewhere else you know they could be government bailouts stuff like that which has happened before um but if it's a traditional business you know it's just relying solely on profit to you know keep operating then yeah they have to sell their products you know at a higher price to a high enough price to keep their business operating to keep it profitable and uh and I think actually what triggers that is some, I think, I think there needs to be an increased money supply to allow um, increased prices um, of anything, you know, uh, not necessarily though, but I think it, 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 it kind of creates a, an environment where it's more likely to happen, where it's, uh, where, where certain companies, you know, can see that if they charge the higher price, you know, voluntarily, that customers will still pay it, you know, and if there's just enough money floating around and enough demand, then yeah, that'll happen, you know, um, and it's when one of those companies raises prices that I think those prices get pushed down the supply chain to the consumer, you see higher prices everywhere. So I think that's really how uh, inflation kind of works now i've actually explained it i think what's it called the uh i forget what it's called right now but i call it like trickle down inflation it's like with, with current monetary policy um or, or with fractional reserve banking and banks like around the country the world whatever you know being able to create money on the spot create credit on the spot and being able to affect the money supply, either increasing it or decreasing it, you know, depending on how much money's coming in or going out at any given point, <clears throat> um, which is usually governed ultimately by a central bank, which sets a uh, like a base interest rate for all these commercial banks to borrow from uh, 
them. You know, I think the central bank sets the a rate at which commercial banks borrow from them, which allows them to set a rate themselves again to stay profitable, which, you know, depending on if the um, interest rate is high or low, it'll determine, you know, what commercial banks have to charge to make a profit for themselves. So, uh, you know, commercial banks generally will charge a little bit more in interest uh, so they can take that cut, you know, of of what they charge people versus what they owe uh, the central bank, you know, assuming they borrow from those central banks. But fractional reserve is really tricky. It's uh, banks can lend to each other, I think, and uh, the money supply can just grow like crazy. And uh, then that money's handed to people who borrow that money, whoever these banks approve for credit loans. And uh, then they go to the market and they trade that newly created money. If it's digital, paper doesn't really matter. Well, usually if it's commercial bank, it's going to be like a digital uh, type of money, which can usually actually be redeemed for paper money. But there's only so much paper money. Let's not get too confused with that. Um, but the point is commercial banks issue credit to people they approve. Once people go to the market, trade it for goods and services, resource, whatever. And a lot of times that there's a lot of new money coming in, a lot of people getting loans, they'll compete with other people in the market for those goods and services. And then the people trading those goods and services see that there's a lot of money, a lot of demand for those goods and services. So they'll say, hey, we can raise prices. And these people that are getting these loans from the bank, you know, if the banks are approving a lot of them, you know, even if it's ridiculous, you know, to do so. Uh, that money will keep coming in and these people can raise prices. And when they do that, the prices of those things that people are buying with that newly uh, created money uh, will go up. And then that can be the initial um, cause of a you know, supply chain uh, issue that causes you know everybody along a supply chain to raise prices. And I, I think that's a very direct um, instance of uh you know inflation occurring prices going up you know um you can see with certain things like with houses you know a lot of people get loans for houses and that allows you know people that already own houses you know really they these houses get you know passed on to multiple people before <laughs> the actual resident is going to live in it like investors will buy it sell it again another to another investor that investor will sell it it's like multiple uh price hikes before it actually reaches a uh uh, you know, somebody that's going to be the resident of that house or whatever. And those residents usually go to a bank and get a mortgage. And uh, it's all just borrowed money. It's all because money is being created on the spot. Credit is being created. And, you know, it allows people to have the money to pay the higher and higher prices, you know, all the way up to a consumer. And, uh, and that's where you get, like, bubbles. You know, that's what they call an investment bubble when... Investors are passing an asset up and up and up and prices are just like ridiculous. They're not even like, I don't know, justified maybe. Um, but that's an example. You get like, you know, a housing bubble, um, stuff like that. But the, the, the prices just go way up with all this new money being created or whatnot. Um, it has a very direct like effect right there when it's like the money's fresh, freshly created and People go directly to the market and that allows whatever those people are directly buying, you know, with that money, uh, allows those people to raise prices because they know that those people can just go to the bank and get pretty much as much, pretty much as much money as they want from those banks. And uh, it allows them to raise prices. It doesn't just because there's more money doesn't mean those prices are going to raise. It just creates the conditions that allow uh, people that are selling any given asset uh, to raise those prices. College tuition is another one. A lot of people borrow money and go to college, and then <laughs> college is like, okay, we're going to raise tuition like crazy, and people still <laughs> keep paying it because they think they need that to uh, you know, eventually get a job and have a career. So they're like, they're uh, raising the prices like crazy, and barely anybody can pay out of pocket anymore, you know? And uh, I would say that a lot of the banks that have been, uh, you know, issuing the loans for people to go to college, that's, a lot of that's been reckless. Because some people go to college to get, like, some really stupid degrees that I don't think are going to, uh, you know, 
profit them in the long run. And, you know, those loans from a bank standpoint might have been stupid, you know. It's, uh, you know, usually these banks will kind of ask what you're going to buy with the money. That way, uh, you know, if they have to, they can seize those assets to, uh, you know, bounce and then, then, you know, auction them off to bounce the books. But, uh, yeah, so I think it's kind of irresponsible on banks' parts for uh, issuing a lot of loans for tuition for, you know, silly degrees and stuff like that. But maybe they knew the whole time because a lot of people are talking about a bailout, like a government bailout of like student loans. Maybe they knew that already was going to happen. They're like, it's okay, government's going to pay us if they don't. Like, <laughs> so who knows? Who knows? I don't know. There could be a lot of inside deals like that. Just to you know, be honest, I don't know how much lobbying exists in the in the government. You know, with big corporations and banks and stuff like that. Um, but my point is, uh, you know, inflation. I don't think it's just created by just money. I think there's certain factors that allow people to raise prices, which includes, um, you know, an increased money supply. But like I said, you know, there's a direct example of people literally going straight to the bank, getting as much money as they want, being created right there on the spot through fractional reserve banking, um, which is made possible, you know, through the laws that exist with fiat currency. Um, and then they go, can go directly to the market and those people selling uh, you know, to those people borrowing that money, uh, they can they can usually raise prices pretty high, and then you get, you know, that supply chain push action that uh, raises prices all the way down the line. You know, the supply chain, and uh, I think that's really how inflation works. To be honest, that's just I guess from our perspective, I think it's kind of easy to see when you. I, I think that's how it works. I mean, there's no other factors. I think I'm missing too much. You know, all all I'm really doing is considering, well, you know, I like to say that the entire economy is trading, which is deals, deals are being made, there's supply and demand with every deal. Actually, for either side of a trade, you know, both are the supplier of what the other wants, and both are demanding what the other has. And so it's like, you know, supply and demand is not like either or, it's like they're both that to each other. And it's always a, uh, there's a supply of money, there's a supply of whatever it is people are trying to trade for that money. So it's always like a two-way street and uh, it's kind of like a balancing act, you know, <clears throat> there, there's the, uh, there's active money supply, then there's like the idle money supply, which also has an effect, you know, how much people are, you know, saving versus spending, you know, that, that, that also plays a part in like, I think the active money supply is more relevant to that whole balancing act, you know, what's actually being spent. And then it also matters like what specifically the money's being spent on, you know, which I think will create different, you know, like pressures, you know, <laughs> I don't know what that balancing act um, for any given type of good or service. Um, you know, it's very dynamic. It's not like fixed. You know, a lot of governments have been talking about fixing costs. That might be okay sometimes, but I think the government, because I was just reading about like, Keynesian economics and stuff and and like then there's like stagflation in the 70s and Keynesian economics like apparently weren't correct because it wasn't like holding up with all the theories and stuff and then came Milton Friedman with his ideas and then they applied those and kind of worked out um so the like the governments apply different economic theories over time <laughs> sometimes they're like completely wrong and it's just like it just makes things worse um, so I'm really hesitant to say that the government should do anything. So they really, you know, until it's really understood, like what these, uh, like, like, like the functions of these different pressures and things like that are, and, uh, it's very dynamic, but I think it can be managed if we understand it well enough. I just think what it's been for so long has been like so much like, I don't know, like theoretical, you know, hypo, maybe not hypothetical, but like. It's been like hypotheses of like how things work and then like people are like okay it sounds good let's try it like <laughs> just like messing stuff up yeah, it's been kind of a what do you want to call that uh a lot of risk taking a lot of you know just seeing if things work you know a lot of experimenting with stuff um i'm not sure if that's the best way to do it so you know what i'm saying I, th I think that price you know uh fixed prices you know government fixing prices in some cases could stop inflation but then it also creates you know if there's still money being created and i don't know it just seems like you know we could talk about money 
And that's actually something I like talking about a lot. But, uh, you know, with money creation, with, with fiat, money fractional reserve banking, let's say there are fixed prices, you know, government fixes prices, and people are still just going to the bank and, and the banks are still creating money. That just allows, you know, those people that borrow to buy even more resource, you know, from the market um, at a fixed price, you know, no matter how much money keeps coming into the economy. And uh, it, it almost just like sets the stage for like, uh, I would say like, I mean, I would say that it sets the stage for that type of robbery. I know it sounds pretty extreme, but you know, it's really kind of what it is sometimes. And I know... You know, with the current monetary system, with fiat, um, fractional reserve banking, you know, ultimately banks are supposed to balance their books, but they charge interest on the loans they give. So, um, you know, if you're supposed to balance their books, but people still owe you interest on top of that, you know, but all of the, the money in the economy is borrowed, it's fiat, it's a loan, then there has to be perpetually, or there perpetually has to be more money being created and borrowed by people to pay interest you know just it'll never work out to zero it's perpetual debt you know with the interest that's charged on top because the entire money supply is borrowed with interest charged on top and there's no new money except for borrowed money to pay that interest and as soon as you borrow more money there's more interest it's just it's perpetual debt perpetual interest being owed and uh so not only that um but when that money's created, like I said, people can go to the market and, and, and depending on the current market conditions, let's say there's fixed prices, let's say there's not, um, people can borrow that money and buy a certain amount of goods and services, a certain amount of resource. And, and when that new money comes in, uh, ultimately, and, and I've explained this, um, you know, it, it, the more money there is, the higher prices can go. You know, like I said, like companies, the higher prices, you know, companies can charge or whatnot for their goods and services for their resource whatever um and ultimately there will be inflation if that occurs and uh so if you borrowed money like let's say you borrowed like ten dollars and you bought ten i don't know cans of soda um later on if you want to pay back that ten dollar loan let's if you probably owe interest on top of that too but you want to pay that back um, and and pay that interest to to get the get your loan settled, whatever. If inflation occurs rapidly enough, then to acquire, you know, let's say you still have those ten cans of soda, you can sell them back to the market for dollars. But instead of just getting ten dollars back, what you bought it for, you can get like a thousand dollars because inflation is so crazy. And so you could literally sell one can for a hundred dollars, pay back that loan and the interest. And then still have those nine cans of soda plus whatever the other 80 something, you know, whatever it is, you know, the $10 plus interest taken off that hundred that you sold one can for. And uh, in that way, money creation uh, benefits, you know, people that borrow um, inflation. It benefits people with outstanding loans because to get that money back, to pay those loans back, especially if it happens rapidly. Um, you only have to trade, you have to trade a lot less resource than what you bought initially with however much money you borrowed, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and that's kind of what happens. And, and in that way, it's kind of like a long-term type of like robbery, I would say. Um, and eventually, and eventually, you know, it keeps happening and happening. It goes to a, to an ultimate place where the the money is literally worthless and you can trade literally one can of soda instead of for a thousand dollars to pay back a ten dollar loan you can you can trade it for a trillion you know if it's that worthless if the money is that worthless you can trade one can of soda for a trillion dollars because there's just such a huge money supply nobody uses it anymore uses it anymore and uh, you can pay back that loan you know uh, how much is that 100 billion times over you know um, with, uh, or well, whatever. I mean, you know, you get it, right? Um, <clears throat> and that's like the long term, like life cycle of a, uh, you know, fiat currency. You know, I think it ultimately goes to zero, and everybody that has debt in that currency can pay back those loans like nothing, 
because nobody uses it anymore and uh just worthless paper at that point but i wonder actually if that's possible with what i was saying with the uh you know the entire supply being borrowed and like i guess eventually somebody's gonna be defaulting you know somebody's not gonna be able to you know if, if all that money goes back in then there's still gonna be interest owed and somebody's not gonna be able to pay that back there'll be a lot of people not able to pay pay that back even if it goes to zero even or you know if the relative value of any given currency is you know so inflated or uh devalued you could say that uh it's almost zero you know they're still on paper like you know interest that's owed and so it's like it's impossible to pay back that interest even if the money eventually becomes worthless paper you know relatively worthless paper it's uh interest is still owed in that currency how do you pay that back if every single dollar is borrowed with interest that's owed on top and there's no dollars created to you know to, to pay back those dollars you know that interest it's like it's impossible it's a, it's a ponzi scheme basically some type of scheme i don't know what you want to call it it's definitely some type of scheme that's literally impossible to pay back because that money doesn't exist to pay that interest and it won't so long as every single dollar is borrowed like that you know there's the option of uh you know banks let's say you know offering to accept something else in return for interest you know interest being paid with a different type of money it could be gold and that, that happened before maybe some type of like government printed money something like that um nowadays we have bitcoin that's something to look out for the thing with bitcoin that bothers me is that the entire supply is already bought up pretty much and i mean of course it's gonna be new mining over time but i think most of the supply that will ever exist is already mined or whatnot and uh and i think most of that most of the bitcoin that exists today are in the hands of relatively a uh, small group of people like a few people and if they pretty much already control the entire money supply let's say we eventually use that as money you know let's say like i said you know the active supply versus latent supply if there's a small active supply and people start using it you know the value of it relative to goods and services will be really high and then the people that are holding on to the rest of the supply can then you know just like you know spend little increments of what they what they're holding on to to buy you know real goods and services from the market and right there that's almost worse than you know fiat and money creation you know because you know at least when money's created um from a bank you know there's a current you know exchange rate to goods and services but like if somebody really if, if a small group of people own like an entire supply of a type of money and they only allow there to be a small you know active supply then the relative you know price of, of goods and services to that small active supply will be you know kind of disproportional and then uh you know like i said with that the rest that's latent you know they can uh just little little slivers off of that you know they, they can have more latent money than the entire active money supply and if they did they just you know go to the market and buy at that current exchange rate you know of that money to goods and services then they might be able to literally buy the entire world you know what i'm saying if the entire world is using that type of money um it's it, it's it's with with fiat i feel like there's not the opportunity for borrowers really to manipulate that active supply versus you know goods and services uh relative value situation with let's say if everybody starts using bitcoin or something like that or a large portion of the world starts using bitcoin uh then those you know they, what they call whales they can uh affect you know the existing or the, the active money supply just by holding on to everything that they have and uh you know and if they have you know latent you know a lot of bitcoin and there's a, a relative trading value you know they can go to the market and just like they can buy up everything if they want to it's a very kind of dangerous situation that i think a lot of people are you know overlooking right now that's my quip main quip with bitcoin um so yeah i don't know i just want to talk about this stuff a little bit um i don't know so like 
you can you can kind of see the dynamics there. I've, I've talked about this in different videos and stuff. That's what I do. I don't. I'm too lazy to write. <laughs> like I would write a book, but like really, it's, I like videos so much simpler these days. Other people can write the stuff down. Just I don't know. Just it's, I don't know. When I wrap my head around something, I just want to like get it out. Just explain it. I don't really have time to sit down and write a whole book. So maybe I'll do it eventually. But for right now, this is what you get. You get video. So hope this was helpful. Like I said, I've made other videos explaining stuff, and uh, yeah, I just want people to be able to see like these market dynamics. It's like there is money, and there is you know other goods and services, and there's like deals being made. There's there's people that want to trade this money for these goods and services, and there's deals that are being made, and you know depending on how much money and how much you know of any good or service there is that you know how much on either side or trying to exchange for the other, you know, there's going to be certain deals that are being made, you know, depending on that amount of supply and demand of either one for each other. And right, and then there's competition on either side. You know, there's people that are trying to get the money, you know, trading this good or service, and there's people that are trying to get that good or service trading the money. And there's competition between those people to, you know, you know get a good deal. And, uh, you know, sometimes that's affected by availability locality stuff like that but generally that's what's happening there's deals being made just like on like uh what do you want to call it a uh like in, in the stock market where you see like people trading a certain amount of money for any given stock and you see that's that charted like second by second it's the same thing happening in the economy like day by day like a, a store can change prices sometimes you see gas prices changing and people accept that deal those those that offer you know, they see gas prices changing and they say, okay, that's the gas price they're offering. I'll go there, I'll get gas. And you trade your money for that gas. You're accepting an offer. That's a deal being made. And you can change day by day. And, and those prices could be tracked if people really want to. Just like on the stock market, prices are being tracked. And uh, and the pressures that, that create that, you know, that deal being made, you know, it's, it's when that deal is actually executed, that's really what, like, determines what the going price is of something you know um and that changes you know every single deal goes up and down and up and down and um but there's pressures that's what i was trying to talk about you know the underlying conditions that exist that allow uh you know either the supplier of a good or service or somebody's you know offering money for something to uh you know either give more or less in exchange for whatever it is they're trying to get their hands on and uh you know that that that's really the dynamic that's at hand is it's it's a the economy is all trading and trading with trading there's there's offers being made and, and ultimately deals being made and executed and uh that's what should and you know really needs to be uh you know charted if you want to look at like these changing prices and stuff and uh you really have to understand the underlying dynamics that's what i was trying to say i mean i don't think it's that hard if you just like kind of put yourself in the shoes of you know either person on either side of a deal and like really just try to think of their psychology like why they're charging this much or you know what's going on what the environment is the economic environment they're in it's, it's if you can manage that i think you can manage to kind of wrap your head around a conglomerate version of that you know with like deals being made all over the economy and like just seeing the various pressures that play into the dynamic and uh i don't know kind of might be a little bit of a high living higher <laughs> higher level thinking um exercise kind of but i think people can do it so yeah all right well that's all i gotta say for now um just some thoughts so what i want to share so i'm leaving that I'll talk to y'all later. Hope you got something from this. Stay well. Let's do good as a species. Let's get it. Peace out.